this for the last, or read it or been read to every Christmas for the last, oh, I don't know, 30 years or so. Anyway, uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 8, we're going to read down through 17. It says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them unto heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I come before you, Lord, as humbly as I know how. Father, I, I ask for your help. Lord, I ask that you would give me strength and wisdom to be able to deliver what I feel you've laid on my heart and that your spirit would take this and do what you will with it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I debated on a few different titles for tonight's message. Originally, I was going to call it the greatest thing an angel ever said. I tossed around the message of the angels, one of the most common titles I think I've ever heard for Christmas, me uh, Christmas sermons, but I want to take my title from verse 17 tonight, and I want to preach on the saying, uh, the sayings concerning the child. Amen? Sayings concerning the child. Now, I'm going to do things a little differently. Usually, I have quite a, a uh, clearly laid out uh, either you know, message that rhymes or starts with the same letter or something along those lines. But tonight I want to take my points specifically from this scripture. And there are three things that I see here tonight in this message that the angels gave. And, and specifically in the message that was reiterated, we find this same thing reiterated by the shepherds. Amen? And, and I want to look at that for a minute. What was told the shepherds in verse 17, the Bible says they took that and they spread it abroad. Amen? Notice the Bible says they took the sayings concerning the child and they spread those abroad. They didn't spread abroad the fact that they saw the baby of course, I'm sure that was part of it. But what they were focusing on, the angels declared something so important, so monumental, and I will argue the greatest thing that was ever mentioned from heaven to earth. In such a manner, they spread it, it was said in such a powerful manner that the shepherd said, I have got to share this news. Amen? The first thing I want to point out is that the angels in verse 10 said, fear not. Amen? Fear not. We could just stop right there and, and have a lengthy sermon, and we're going to take a few minutes. But there's something about this very simple phrase. It's mentioned some 60 to 70 times in the Bible, but this exact phrase is such a powerful lesson and such a powerful promise that God is telling us, don't be afraid. You have nothing to be afraid of. You can stop your worrying. Webster calls it this. Webster says that fear is something, an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. But I would call fear the anticipation of the uncertain. I would look at it as something, when there is uncertainty, there is fear. 
right? How many, you know, you, you, how many people are afraid of, of, of spiders because they're afraid of getting bit? How many people are afraid they don't know what's going to happen to them when they do get bit? I would say that's more likely. How many times people are afraid of jumping off a building? Not because they're, they're afraid of, of what they know, but they're afraid of what they don't know. What would happen at the bottom? Right? It's that uncertainty. And so because of that, there's uh, approximately 400 different phobias. Did you know that? 400 different phobias that are, in, that are, are specifically uh, categorized in our society today. Fear. Fear is an important motivator. It is a thing the devil loves to use. He loves to bring about things that you don't know. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what the future is going to hold. You don't know whether things are going to be good or bad. You don't know whether or not the finances are going to be there. You don't know whether or not the job will sustain through whatever turmoil we face. You don't know what's going to happen. And because of that, fear is always there. You don't know what's in the dark, so you're afraid of it. You don't know uh, what it's gonna, what you're gonna, what words are gonna come out of your mouth when you stand in front of a public place and you have to speak in front of public, and so you don't, you don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know if they'll laugh at you. You don't know if they'll, if they'll throw tomatoes at you. Hopefully, you didn't bring any tonight. But because of that, it creates fear, the uncertainty. Joshua struggled with this in the Bible, in the Old Testament. In the first chapter of Joshua, three times God had to echo these words, fear not. Verse 6, be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse 9, for uh, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Verse 18, Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words, if thou wilt commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. Being afraid is not something that we're, that we're not accustomed to. It's a natural part of who we are. You wake up and you're afraid to face today or whatever the case may be. But we see in the life of Joshua, it was something that was driving him into the promised land, his fear. So God had to tell him over and over again, be of good courage. Straighten up. It's going to be all right. Don't be afraid. And he goes on in the uh, verse chapter 10 of Joshua. Joshua got the message from God. And so he declares unto the people, fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all thine enemies against whom ye fight. It finally took 10 chapters. But Joshua in the Old Testament realized that his fear was unfounded because of God. David prophesied about fear in the 23rd Psalm. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for God, for thou, O Lord, art with me. Isaiah told us in uh, Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I want you to understand, though, everything in the Old Testament, every time God gave them a promise, every time there was encouragement to not be afraid, every single time was fulfilled in what the angels were delivering at this moment. All of the things you ever worried about are fulfilled in the fact that Jesus Christ is coming today. Everything in the Old Testament, all those 60-some times that are mentioned, all of those times that God was giving them encouragement was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then every time that in the, uh, every time in the future, there were a few times Paul had to be encouraged in the book of Acts. There were times Jesus encouraged the people not to be fearful. Every moment was pointing to this spot. Why can I go encourage? Because there's a, there's a baby. How can I move forward? Because there's a baby named Jesus. Fear not. Number two, we find in this scripture, he says, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
The second thing that we see here tonight, this message that is of massive value to us, is not only do we not have to be afraid, but this promise is to all people. It's to everybody. There wasn't a single person at the birth of Christ, that when the birth of Christ happened, there wasn't a single person on earth that would not be affected by His birth. There's not a single person in all of eternity that would never be affected by Christ coming to earth. That's why it's so important. You, up to this moment, humanity was cursed aside from God's temporary salvation to Israel. There wasn't another group of people that could say, I'm the promised of God and I can live eternally because I have God in my life. Not another single person. There wasn't a group of people that said, I have it right and God loves me. Until this point, all of humanity, aside from Israel, were promised destruction. But at this moment, fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which is for everybody. Hallelujah. It's for everybody. I, uh, I remember hearing this story when I was a child. I remember uh, I was actually reading this, this book, the uh, missionary book, about Samuel Morris. And this, is, this book always fascinated me about the conversion back in the, or the late 1800s of a missionary named Samuel Morris. He was a, a young man who was, a, he was a, a prince of a tribe in Africa and Liberia, I believe. And uh, he was captured by a warring tribe and he was held captive. And the day before he was going to be killed, the Bible said, or the story goes, rather, not the Bible, but the story goes that a bright light from heaven shone upon Samuel Morris, and his bonds that were had him tied to a post were released. And he heard a voice from above, from heaven, tell him, You're free, now run. And in this story, he ran, he hid in a he hid in a log, a hollowed log, escaped his captors. He continued to run up north, and he ended up finding his way to a mission. And from, at that mission, he learned English, he got saved. His name was changed from whatever his tribal name was to Samuel Morris. And he became a missionary to the United States, of all places, which is a fascinating story. But in that story, it always amazed me that somebody who had no knowledge of God, who had no experience, there was no, there was no missionary in his tribe that was telling him about Jesus. There was nothing of the sort. But God saw fit in his infinite wisdom to be able to shine himself upon this kid, save his life, and from there it became a massively successful missionary to Chicago, if I remember correctly. Saved, turned an entire university around and, and started missionary to, missioning or ministering to people in Chicago, if I remember correctly. But in that story, that's what Jesus' birth did. He opened it up so that anybody in any tribe, in any place, at any moment can look up to heaven and say, Lord, here I am. And they can receive the gift of eternal life. Why? Because for unto us a child is born to everybody. For God so loved the world. That's what was so amazing about this message, not only did it destroy fear, that fear is destroyed. Why? Because what I'm about to tell you is for everybody. There's not a single person that is not affected. To that point, that's also a very damning statement. Because there's not a single person on earth that can say, well, it wasn't for me. God didn't provide something for me. God didn't give me an option. Lord, you can't, you can't send me to my eternal damnation because I didn't have an option. Yeah, you did. Because it's for everybody. Amen? The third thing we read, for unto us, verse 11, for unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Point number three. Not only was there no fear, we have fear not, it's to all people, but there's a Savior. And I find it interesting in all of, of these, uh, uh, in all of the places that God could have revealed this information to, He revealed it to shepherds. 
And I remember as a kid hearing stories about how shepherds are just in Israel were some of the most worthless, vile people. They were the equivalent of, of sailors in our minds, I think. Uh, but upon further review, there was something about these shepherds. And I don't know this to be true. I wasn't there. I'm not that old. But I can tell you that from the speculation that I've read and the information that I've absorbed from people, these shepherds very likely were the shepherds tasked with raising the spotless lambs for the atonement. That's who they were. These were very important people. These people that very, very likely, these shepherds had one mission, and that was to aid in the temporary sustaining of God's destruction on Israel. You talk about an important job. Right? I got I to gotta make sure we find a spotless lamb. We have to find the lamb for atonement. That is my job. Can you imagine being in charge of that role all night? It's no wonder they were out in the fields with their sheep by night. Why? Because they had one mission. The entire fate of our nation could rest on me. On me, on you. We're the shepherds. It's an entire, an entire sustaining, making sure that we hold off the judgment of God for another year could have very likely been on these shepherds. And for God to reveal there's a savior to these men. Oh, what a message. My entire life, I was the, I was there to make sure that there was a sheep so that God's saving grace would sustain for one more year. But I want you to know that God came to me and promised there's a savior born tonight. Talk about coming to the right people at the right time. There's such an important element there. There would be no more perfect group to appear to than these shepherds telling them the work is coming to an end. You're almost out of a job, folks, because there's a Savior born. But not only the shepherds, there's the element of the symbolism. The shepherds heard the words of the angels, and notice this, they knew exactly where to go. There was all the, all the angels said, uh, for, there's a, a child born, you should find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And do you realize the shepherds went right there and they found the baby? Now I want you to know, at least in my mind, there had to be some element. And I've heard stories and research about how these shepherds would actually have a, a specific place where they would birth baby, the baby lambs, the lambs. There's a very specific place that they would, a, a manger scene, a, uh, a stable, if you will. And there's speculated that that is exactly where Jesus was born because it would have had all the elements to, to birth a child, to birth it, at least as much as they could have. And so it's interesting that the shepherds knew exactly where to go. The, the Bible says that they found the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. It's believed that swaddling clothes and a manger was a place where they would lay the lambs. They would wrap them in swaddling clothes and lay them in a manger so that they wouldn't kick and scream, scratch themselves, and, and subsequently damage their value as a sacrifice. If that's true, that's exactly where Christ was laid. Talk about a powerful image. Can you imagine the shepherds at first being told, hey, there's a Savior coming. Your job is coming to an end. And they realize, I'm going to go find him. And I have a feeling he's going to be right here because of all the symbols that are said by the angel. And from there, they find the babe, Jesus Christ, laying in the exact spot, potentially, the very same spot where that precious lamb would be laid, telling them he's here to do the work. This is it. Up to this point, do you realize that all the Israelites were ever thinking about, all they were promised was a Messiah. They were never promised the sacrifice element. They believed that somebody was going to come in. And this is why the, uh, the, uh, the day of Jubilee, the uh, when Jesus marched into Jerusalem, they thought this was victory coming, but instead it was defeat, at least in their mind. But the shepherds were inclined to realize long before there had to be a sacrifice. The awesome part. 
there had to be a sacrifice. God was setting the stage that this Messiah was not coming to destroy, but he was coming to be destroyed. He wasn't coming to overthrow. He was coming to be overthrown and subsequently overthrow sin's power. They were looking for a Messiah to politically save them, but God was promising them a Messiah to spiritually fix every problem. Hallelujah. The symbolism and the sacrifice. The nation was looking for a Savior, one who would bring deliverance. God was looking to bring a sacrifice, one that would bring deliverance. Amen. The promise, there is no fear. Why is there no fear? There's no fear to anybody. Nobody has to suffer through the fear of life, through the fear of death. Nobody has to do it. Why? Because it's to everybody. And what is it? It's a Savior. Hallelujah. That's why this time of the year is so important. It's not because of gifts. It's not even because of a manger so much or or decorations or a little baby being born. And, and, And we celebrate that. What it is, is what was promised that there is a Savior. That's what it's all about. That's what every element of this this season is all about, is there's a Savior. There's a gift that was going to be destroyed so that we could have eternal life. Amen. Hannah, if you'll come to the piano. Heavenly Father, Lord, I lift You up. I praise You here tonight. I thank You, Lord, for that special gift that You gave us. I thank You for the promise of a Savior. Lord, I thank You that You worked all the details out. There's not a a single piece of the details You did not work out in advance. I thank You for that. Lord, I ask that You would please take this message. Lord, I I believe that our church is full of people who are saved. I'm, I'm excited about that. But maybe, oh Lord, there's somebody who needs to hear this maybe over the internet. Or there's somebody who needs to hear this message through one of us. And so Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and we ask that you would set it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's find a place of prayer.